So in this lecture, we're going to focus on the connections between race, identity, and television. So we're going to think through three of the articles. We're going to talk about A Fish Out of Water, we're going to talk about Apu's Brown Voice, and we're going to talk about Performing Race and Negotiating Identity. We're going to think about the issues raised in these three articles in relation to these terms from last time. On the one hand, subjectivity, and on the other hand, subjectlessness. We're going to break down what it means to talk about television as a storytelling medium that's both sonic, visual, and textual. I said both, there's actually three. In relation to its form, its content, and its specific narrative. So first of all, I want us to think more expansively about the terms, on the one hand, Asian Pacific American, and on the other hand, US Latina Latino. On the one hand, we can think about them in terms of subjectivity, right? The identity that's represented and the people who are represented. On the other hand, we can think about it in terms of subjectlessness. We can think of Asian American and US Latina Latino as naming specific types of anti-racist politics that can, that can take place through popular culture. Because as I've seen, many of you are very skeptical about the possibilities of popular culture. So maybe thinking about it in this way can open it up. And we can think about how these two terms are not mutually exclusive and can indeed work together. So I'm going to start out with a fish out of water. Because here we can see that based on the author's argument, maybe if you've watched more seasons of it, you can produce a more expansive argument that maybe contradicts this. But we can think about how this show is uh, Latina, Latino, both in terms of subjectivity and in terms of the type of critique that it sends about previous representations of Latinas on TV. On the level of form, we can think about the show as an adaptation of a telenovela. So then we can think about it as a specific kind of Latina, Latino product in relation to its form, a kind of transnational adaptation. We can also think about it as a specific type of community text. The author talks about these kind of wink moments, distinctive to certain audiences. How, for example, legends from the telenovela form appear in the series, or how Salma Hayek plays a specific role, not just as its producer, but also as a, a guest, recurring guest star. So at the level of form, we then see how it speaks to different kinds of audiences in different ways. It doesn't stop U, uh, US audiences from enjoying the show or appreciating it, but people who come from specific cultural backgrounds have a certain angle on it where they understand certain aspects that for the rest of us kind of slide by. At the level of content, we can think about its representation of Latina and Latino characters. Not just representing them, but also representing them as central representations, right? We follow the Suarez family throughout, I think it went on for four seasons, as opposed to, for example, Law and Order will occasionally have a Latino appear as a gang member or as a murder victim, as just kind of a side thing. So on the level of content, it does a very important representational politic by having Latinos as central characters. And then at the level of narrative, not only does it have multiple Latino characters that are recurring, we also see that it offers a range of representations. Latinidad doesn't become a single thing, and it can't be reduced to a single meaning. The author talks about how, looking at the four members of the Suarez family, we get different ideas about what it means to exist on this range between ethnic difference versus a type of assimilation. So, if we're talking about ethnic difference and assimilation, I don't want to reduce this to assimilation being the only good kind of representation. So, we're thinking about this balance and this range and how we get multiple ideas of Latino subjectivity based on the narrative. We can also pay attention to how, if we're looking at things like Ugly Betty, it's not an authentic representation based on what you all have discussed in the working definition of authenticity. We can, however, think about the very useful things that it does culturally based on how it works through form, content, and narrative. This also allows us to think about Asian Pacific American and US Latina Latino categories not as a certain kind of traditional back-in-the-home country type of thing, but thinking about this hybrid identity or maybe this transculturated identity that exists between multiple different national traditions. So then moving to Apu's brown voice. If we're looking at the article on Ugly Betty, we can see how 
by looking at these different issues, it can be seen as a kind of progressive text. If we look at The Simpsons, we then have to ask a question mark, is it a kind of anti-racist Asian American text? At the level of form, we see that it's animation, so it's not rep a representation of a real thing. But we do have to ask ourselves really complicated questions about whether the representation of Apu is mimicry or minstrelry, right? Is it an homage to South Asian peoples, or is it a parody, and is it poking fun at them? It's a complicated question because The Simpsons, having gone on for so many years, has on the one hand, you know, regularly made fun of Apu, but on the other hand, has used him as a kind of central character and a dependable member of the community. We can also see how the accent at the level of form reduces uh, racial and ethnic difference to a single thing. This is an issue that we see recurring throughout these different texts, not just thinking about visual representations, but also thinking about sound and how that participates in the ways that we read these characters. At the level of content, it does represent Apu as a central member of the community. But if you look on page, uh, if you look at page 315, we get that Apu uh, represents a type of cultural inflection. So a central category that we talk about in this reading is cultural citizenship. As we briefly discussed last week, cultural citizenship refers to other ways of belonging. We have legal citizenship, which is a very uh, documentation-based process, but we also have cultural citizenship as a basis for judging who's in and who's out of the community, who belongs and who doesn't belong, who participates equally, and who does not. So if we're thinking about cultural inflections, we're thinking about limited inclusions of cultural citizenship. As long-term viewers of The Simpsons see, Apu is always a central member of the Springfield community, but everyone always looks at him as being culturally different, which does lead to some interesting episodes where we go deep into Apu's life, find out about his history, find out about his family and the expectations of him, but he's always seen as kind of an other. And at the level of narrative, we see how these representations of Apu get mistaken as the realities of actual South Asian Americans. We see how Apu becomes a cultural spokesperson, even though animation should lead us to believe that this is entirely a work of fiction. So even when dealing with this different kind of genre, because with Ugly Betty, we're talking about mimetic representation, right? It appears like our reality. With animation, or for example, science fiction, we're distinctly in a fictional universe, but we see how when people use these texts, they make understandings of the real world through them. And finally, performing race and negotiating identity. We then also ask a question mark about, is this a subjectless, subjectless type of Asian American critique based on what these actors are doing? At the level of form, we can definitely tell that there's an underrepresentation of Asian Pacific American actors in Hollywood. And we can also see the difference that their individual performances make when we're talking about the types of stereotypes that they're expected to perform. So on that, in that way, it can be kind of a progressive subjectless type of politic. But at the level of content, we see that what they are given is oftentimes stereotypical and offensive. So, I mean, we do see more Asians on TV nowadays, but we ha often have to ask ourselves, at the level of form, it's important, but at the level of content, what type of ideological regulation does it participate in? So, again, we can see that resistance is not the same as agency, because for resistance to work through popular culture, form, content, and narrative would need to work together. But we can see that based on what these individual actors do, they each exercise a very complicated type of agency. So we can understand agency is taking place against the type of structural and institutional forms that they deal with. Structural referring to this macro level expectation of what we have of Asian and Asian Americans, and institutional as referring to the specific norms of Hollywood. And finally, at the level of narrative, the actors, too, have a deep discussion about the accents that they're expected to perform and the types of appearances that they're expected to have. So we can see how these representations, like Shilpa Dave argues, map onto hierarchies of difference. On page 254, there's a very interesting discussion of the term stereotype, 
we can see how it works through a binary structure, and we can also see how it reflects inequalities of power. So it's an issue of thinking about difference versus otherness, representing Asian American identity, but not making it something that's marginalized and excluded.